Hi there, welcome along to another video. It's good to have you here. And today we're doing a box opening and review of a new item that's come out from Oxford Rail comparatively recently. And uh, there's only one particular livery available at the moment, but there's further three forthcoming. So without further ado, let's take a closer look. <laughs> So what we got here is the new Oxford Rail N7062 tank locomotive. And so far, straight, it's a little bit strange actually that they've brought out first the Great Eastern Railway wartime austerity grey livery. So we're still waiting for the LNER and the BR liveries. So uh, I'm not really quite sure why that is, but yeah, it's okay for me because the pre-grouping livery is what I tend to really get attracted to. So we've got a catalogue number on the end. It's uh, code OR76N70001. And this is the Great Eastern Railway uh, K85. That was its original designation, later known as the N7 in LNR. ER time and BR time. And what we've got here is number 1002. Oxford Rail are planning DCC sound fitted examples, but none of those have been forthcoming as of yet. It's the pretty standard Oxford Rail packaging, so I'm just going to dig all of this out here. And we get one little uh, extra bag, and I think these are possibly vacuum pipes. So um, they're there to fit if you so desire, and I suspect that you probably have to remove the couplings to be able to do that. So for most people, just leave them tucked in the box. Also down here at the bottom, I'm just going to try and get it out. We get some quite comprehensive instructions, which gives a little bit of background on, on the class. So you can see here the Great Eastern Railway class K85, later to be reclassified by the LNER as N7, were originally designed by Alfred John Hill of the Great Eastern Railway and took to the tracks in 1915. So they were a wartime delivery. There's a bit more information on there. But further inside here, we've got some information about, um, well it says here, fitting, brake rodding and couplings, but they do come factory fitted. Um, we can also see as well a little bit of advice on oiling if needs be. Um, and there's uh, also some quite helpful information here on where the DCC socket is in the, the bunker just there. And I believe it's an eight pin socket. And it also shows you how to be able to get the lid off. It appears that there's only, let's have a look. Uh, it says one, two, three and four. I think there's just the possibly three screws holding it on. In fact, yeah, we can see here one at the front underneath the coupling and then one either side there. We'll get a closer look at those once we get to the model itself. And uh, that's pretty much all we get in there. But it is helpful that manufacturers are starting to uh, show people how to get into these, certainly with the advent of DCC fitting. It's really useful to be able to get inside these things. Uh, there's quite a few that, uh, certainly from Helgen, that do seem to be an epic test of endurance to be able to get inside and to um, stand a chance of DCC fitting them. First impressions of it are it's very, very weighty and you can actually feel it's um, it's been in a, a cold environment for a little while. So the metal castings, which are the uh, water tanks on the side and the bunker sides itself, they're solid metal and it adds a great weight to this. So in terms of um, sitting on the track, it certainly has everything it needs for good traction. First impressions of the livery application. We've got this austerity grey, really well uh, applied. It's a nice finish. It's certainly one that's, I, don't, I, I look at it and it, it reminds me more of the photographic grey, uh, but um, I, I suspect the real ones uh, back in the day were a nightmare to keep clean. 
but in model form, straight out of the box, it does really look nice. And we've got some very crisp demarcations between the black and the grey, which really makes it stand out. It's almost an Art Deco sort of a uh, application of livery. Other colours are not neglected. We've got the uh, brass effect of uh, what I suspect are... I'm not quite sure what those fittings are. We've also got the brass funnel top there and a brass band around the front of the boiler. We also seem to have... Uh, let's just have a quick look. I think that they may be metal whistles there. It's very difficult to tell but they look like they could be a metal whistles and, you know, looks are everything with these things. The safety valve cover there and the safety valves themselves, they are really nicely done. Separately factory applied pieces and uh, they look really, really nice. In terms of uh, ruggedness, I've got it out of the box here and the pipework is all pretty well attached. There's nothing falling off and that's something which from some of the manufacturers has been a little bit of a problem, but we're not getting any of that from Oxford Rail with this, which is their, I think it's their third locomotive offering after the Dean Goods and the Janus Industrial Shunter. The buffers are all sprung, turned metal, every single one there. We also have some of the buffer beam pipe detail ready fitted, any that doesn't foul the coupling. And uh, we can see on the front there the red buffer beam with the number, number 1002, picked out in yellow and black. One thing I would say about the yellow is where it's over painting a tempo printed over the red, it does look like there's quite a bit of bleed through of the red through the yellow. So it mutes that yellow down a little bit. I wouldn't say it's a great detraction, uh, but I don't know whether it's meant to be like that or whether we're seeing a reoccurrence of the problem which uh, Oxford Rail had with some of their red base liveried private owner wagons. The front smoke box door, I don't think it opens. I'm just trying there. No, it does seem to be pretty well shut. And actually opening smoke box doors, very much a gimmick, which um, I would not be unhappy to see the back of. I think they all they do is add cost without adding anything in terms of value to a model. If I turn the model round to the back, we've got a representation of a coal load in the bunker. I'm not actually sure whether that is removable, but it sits well below these greedy bars around the uh, top. So if you want to fill that up with a representation of real coal, you can do that by crushing down a lump of real coal. And there's plenty of space to glue in over the top without uh, compromising it and making it look like it was stupidly over full. The cab back head detail seems to be quite simplified compared with some of the more recent offerings that we've seen from both Backman and Hornby, but I wouldn't say that that's a massive problem. You're not, in the general rule of things, going to see an awful lot of what's in there. So if it helps keep down cost, then that can only be a good thing. And certainly at a... Uh, price in the shops of around the £87 mark. This is certainly offering a pretty good value for money compared to some of the tank engine offerings that we're getting now from both Hornby and Backman, which are starting to, to crest the £100 mark. The wheels themselves, they're pretty fine spoked there, and I'm particularly pleased with these fluted coupling rods. They are really nicely done. The red is not too garish. It's sort of a, a I wouldn't say completely matte scarlet, but there's an element of shine there, but not enough to make it look silly in model form. And we've got these uh, the oil boxes nicely picked out in the sort of gunmetal colour. The rods appear to be attached with these large hexagonal nuts, but they don't look out of place on the model, so I suspect that they're quite easy to take off, put back on as and when required, uh, without compromising the detail here. As you can see on the underside, the brake rodding on this example has come factory fitted. We've got the couplings in the NEM pockets, so you can easily change them for anything else that you want. The pickup wipers are on 
all six of the driving wheels and I'm looking down there they're a little bit hard to see but as far as I can tell they are touching the wheel backs at both extremes of travel. The pony wheel has this rather interesting arrangement it reminds me a little bit of the Backman 56XX062 Great Western Tanks except it doesn't have any any uh, side to side movement it does have a sort of a twisting motion that it can go through and it can slide quite a good distance from side to side but the wheels will always remain parallel to the driving wheels so um, it should look all right on the track. I have had this test run and this is where the big disappointment for me starts. When it first went on the track it did work kind of. Um, I did have to prod it a few times and I put that down to dirty track initially. I did manage to get a circuit of the track out of it but then it faltered and died completely on me. I've got a severe problem with it. Um, it's just, it's gone dead. There's nothing going on there. And I've got the power on full, full, doesn't matter whether I could do it forwards or backwards. This is a pretty poor show actually on quality control. Um, if I short out, there's definitely power to the track and I'm getting nothing, nothing whatsoever. So I'm going to turn it round, try the other way and it's run for maybe... 30 seconds and then just died completely so that is a very poor show on quality control. I did uh, go through a process of testing the track to make sure and I definitely had power to the track, tried it on both different tracks out in the shed but I couldn't get any further life from it. There was no smell of burning of any sort so it doesn't appear to have burnt out the motor um, for whatever reason and moving the locomotive from side to side verified that uh, it didn't appear to be a problem with the pickups and this for me was a big big disappointment. It's the first locomotive that I can remember getting that has pretty much been come completely dead on arrival and for uh, Oxford Rail's third locomotive offering it's something that really they more than perhaps the other manufacturers need to be much much keener on quality control if they wish to take for themselves a larger slice of the model market. So unfortunately it's probably something that I could fix relatively easily if I took the lid off this. I suspect a dry solder joint but as always, these models are reviewed as is. I take them out of the box and I review them as I see them because that's the state that you, as the viewer to this, would find your own models from the model shop. And really, a model shop shouldn't have to be dealing with this kind of fault. So for that, it's going to get marked down. You might think that that's a little bit unfair, but you know, these things we expect them to work out of the box. It's not a big ask, so really that's something that for me was a major detraction. In terms of its visual appearance, it's a really good model let down by that mechanical reliability. The paint finish is good, the lining is picked out crisply, as is the number 1002 and the uh, red works plate on the back there again with the 1002. Everything else is really crisp. The weight is good. I would have liked to have seen this on a haulage test. Indeed, I had a large number of Hornby teak coaches ready to put this locomotive to the test, but alas, I was unable to do that. After this review is over, I am going to go and have a prod at this, but I fear that it could be something serious in terms of the electrics inside here, and it may have to go back to the shop. One plus point to this model is it is very easy to dismantle. And when I've got the lid off here, uh, what I can see is that there doesn't appear to be any dry solder joints. I've checked the connections to the motor, they're fine. The connections back to the circuit board, they're fine. I've also straightened up this capacitor. Um, it's got, I don't know whether that will show up okay. It's got a wire underneath. And I was worried that that might have been touching. I'm not sure what the effect of that would have been. But I've just bent that away a little bit. Uh, but the particular area that I did wonder about is there's two plungers underneath there that come up from the pickups. 
and I wondered whether one of them was stuck down slightly. So um, I've cleaned them, uh, but it does seem to be a very strange method of attachment um, that is a little bit prone to something going wrong. But uh, now I've had a fiddle, it may actually be a fault, one of those uh, annoying faults that just goes away after you've prodded everything. You never quite know what you did, but um, it appears to have fixed it. Uh, I don't know that yet. I've got to take it back out to the shed. But it's still disappointing that um, you're sort of left pondering the insides of the thing. Still struggling here. If you come out in the shed, I've had a good prod. And all I can find is that if I manually spin that a little bit, we get very intermittent life out of it. There's definitely power reaching from the pickup, so it's not the pickups. There is some issue between all of this. Now, the only other thing I can think of doing is seeing if I can replace that blanking plate with something else and see is it the blanking plate that's causing the issue? But I don't think it is. I think the problem is I've got a dud motor. As a final test, what I've discovered is if I put a screwdriver in here, and it's a bit out of focus, it's quite difficult and short between the terminal and the armature. Then there. It would appear that power is not getting through the motor from this wire unless you short to the armature. It's very peculiar. really don't know what would be causing that. Because of all that, I can't give this a very, very high mark. Um, it has to be said, I think we're probably looking at five and a half out of 10 for this model because I was let down by not being able to put the haulage to the test or to be able to run it. And, you know, visually, aesthetically, this locomotive looks the part. It just needs that reliability out of the box. I always aim to be fair with these reviews. So if it had worked out of the box, um, then I suspect the weight that it has would give it tr good track holding ability. And I would expect it to haul a reasonable length train, even if I can't at this moment put it to the test. Um, if the running characteristics had been as good as some of the previous offerings that we've had, then I reckon a good solid 9 out of 10 for this locomotive. There are a couple of issues with the detail, detail application, uh, not least the uh, number on the front buffer beam. And the livery itself is a strange livery for a first release, and I suspect that the LNER and the BR liveries probably will be uh, far more popular. I do hope that this is going to be an easy fix. If not, it's going to be making a trip back to the retailer and... Yeah, that's hassle for me and for the retailer. As always, these models, they're all ones which uh, I've bought myself. I'm not affiliated with any retailer or any uh, manufacturer. So I just call it as I see it. Well, thanks again for watching. It's been really good to have your company. And uh, don't forget to tickle that like button and share this video too. And subscribe to the channel and ring that bell if you want to be the first to know about new videos as and when they go up. But until next time, you take really good care of yourself. And I'm looking forward to seeing you back here again next time. Bye for now. Today's video has been brought to you in part thanks to the generous donation of my fans on Patreon. And an extra special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson, Mark Anthony, Michael Churchwood, Mark McShane, Bob Threeton, Alec Ralph, Anthony Hunt and William Wade. If you'd like to help support the show, head on over to patreon.com slash Jennifer Kirk. Thank you. Today's video has been brought to you by my books, Bringing Home the Stars, Twinkle Little Star, and also you can get the complete comic collections of All Over the House, Books 1, Books 2, and also the wacky zany Life of Knobty Mouse. Thanks and catch you later.